Four-fifths represents actions, righteous deeds. So that same principle, Iman and Amal Saleh, as being the foundation of Islam is reflected in the five pillars of Islam themselves. The scholars of Aqidah also define Iman, faith, as belief in the heart, expression of that belief on the tongue, and acts by the limbs in accordance with that belief. That even the technical definition of faith, Iman, includes deeds. <coughs> so, this represents the actual foundation of Islam itself. Belief and righteous deeds. However, for these basic principles to, to be of any benefit to us, both need to be analyzed in and of themselves. Faith and righteous deeds. Faith in what? Is it any faith? As long as one has faith, and does righteous deeds, they will succeed? This life will be a success for them? No. There are some who hold this, who express this. No matter what religion you believe in, as long as you sincerely believe in it, you have faith in it, and all religions call to righteous deeds, then you will succeed. However, the message which was left by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, embodied in the Quran itself, whoever desires a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted from him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that idea is not acceptable. When we speak about belief, we're talking about Islamic belief. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is embodied in the principle of Tawheed. This is the foundation. The correct belief, which along with righteous deeds, will then benefit the individual, save him or her from the state of loss in this life. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his unique oneness, which we refer to as Tawheed, in all of its aspects, all of the issues which relate to his dominion over his creation, which relate to his attributes, that distinguish him from his creation, and which relate to worship of him, which distinguishes him from the rest of creation, and that worship belongs only to him alone. That belief, where it is correct, should be supported by Righteous deeds. And again, righteous deeds do have to be, or do have to, or do need some form of clarity, some definition. In that, what you might consider to be righteous, I might not. So, whose definition are we going to follow? There are certain general Righteous deeds, which everybody agrees on. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when he spoke of righteousness, he refers to it as al-ma'ruf. <coughs> al-ma'ruf. That which is known. 
known in all societies. The vast majority of the good which Islam calls to is known in all societies, in all religions. It is not something unique to the final message of Islam alone. It is something that has been around, it's all over the world. It is known. It is Ma'ruf. And the evil which Muslims are obliged to prohibit, to struggle against, this Allah refers to as Al-Munkar, that which is rejected, rejected by societies all around the world, universally known to be evil. However, there still remains elements of good which may not be universally agreed upon, like good being worshipping Allah alone, evil being worshipping other than Allah. Most other religions believe that worshipping other than Allah is good. To worship Jesus, or Buddha, or Brahma, this in other religions is considered to be good. But from the Islamic perspective, this is evil. So ultimately, when we speak about good deeds, we have to define them as the deeds which Allah has defined as good. Those deeds which Allah has identified as good deeds, these are the ultimate and true good deeds. So these have to be combined with correct faith. And good deeds, as we said, deeds are identified as good by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These, for them to be acceptable, they must include the remembrance of Allah. One must be conscious of Allah in doing them. That ensures sincerity in what we're doing. And they must be done in accordance with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They have to be done in accordance with the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, although salah is accepted by everyone as a righteous deed commanded by Allah, how should Salah be done? Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he defined for us, saying, Sallu kama usalli, pray as you saw me pray. So he has defined for us how the prayer should be. So, as a foundation, faith and righteous deeds, both of these principles have to be together. A righteous deed without faith we have those who say, we do good merely for the sake of our knowledge of it being good. We don't have faith in God, but we do good anyway. What are those people? Sometimes they will say, what about the person who doesn't believe in God and he does good? Is he better than a person who believes in God and doesn't do good? The point is that if one does good without belief in God, this good, though people say it is for the sake of something being good, just because we know it is good and it is good to do good, the reality is that they will do good as long as it is convenient to do that good. There are ulterior motives. When doing that good is no longer beneficial, doing that good is going to create problems for you in your life, <coughs> people are doing evil all around you and getting away with it, seeming to succeed, then it becomes very difficult to continue to do that good. It is only the one who believes that ultimately Allah will reward you for that good who will be able 
to be steadfast in doing good, even when it is no longer convenient or beneficial, apparently, in this world, to continue to do that good. So those who say we do good because we know it is good, they have what they call relative good. When they're talking about good, they're talking about relative good. What may be good today may be not good tomorrow. What is not good today may be good tomorrow. It's not relative good. So they'll do it as long as it doesn't create harm for themselves. They don't suffer as a result of it. Because once they're suffering, it's no longer good. Even though it was good originally, we said yes, it was good, but now you're going to suffer because of doing it, it's not good anymore. It's no longer very good. Where it is the believer, one who believes in God, who has defined for him or her good, he or she will stick with that good no matter what. As Allah tells us in the Quran, that we should be just even if it is against ourselves. To be just, it is closer to piety. So, faith in righteous deeds, this forms the foundation of our faith. However, this foundation lies somewhere. There is a place from which this foundation is implemented. We've talked about the concept. But where does this concept grow? Where does it reside? Where does it ultimately become transformed into true righteousness, a truly righteous life? The place as the Prophet ﷺ defined it, saying, إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُدْغَةً إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ Indeed, in the body is a clump of flesh. If it becomes good, then the whole body becomes good. وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ and if it becomes corrupt, the whole body becomes corrupt. Allah wa hiya al Indeed, it is none other than the heart. So the heart is the place where faith and righteous deeds grow. This is the place where it resides. So faith and righteous deeds ultimately is a matter of the heart. So if we are to translate faith and righteous deeds into true righteousness in our lives, then it must find a place, a correct place, in our hearts. We have to address our hearts in such a way that we prepare it for faith and righteous deeds. Because the heart, like a container, a glass, if it is dirty and you pour liquid into it, the liquid becomes corrupted, becomes dirty. The heart is similar. The heart has to be purified, it has to be cleaned in order for faith and righteous deeds to emanate from it. True faith and truly righteous deeds, for them to emanate from the heart, the heart must be purified. And that's why you find so many different hadith statements of the Prophet regarding the heart. So many places in the Quran where Allah talks about the heart. And among them is Allah's statement, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَعْلٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ 
إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم. On the day, the day of judgment, when no wealth nor children will benefit, except one who comes to Allah with a healthy heart. Except one who comes to Allah with a healthy heart. So for faith and righteous deeds to be transformed into righteousness, the heart must be healthy. Ibn al-Qayyim in his text, Irafat al Nahfan, had identified seven major signs which indicate a healthy heart. These signs are worth reflecting on because faith and righteous deeds cannot emanate from a heart which is not free from these signs. The first is that belonging, one feels a sense of belonging to the next world. One feels a sense of belonging to the next world. One's attachment to this world is limited. You have not forgotten what is required of you in this world so that you become such an otherworldly person that your needs are not taken care of, your family's needs are not taken care of, you have totally detached yourself from this world, no. This is why when people attempted to do that, Prophet Muhammad corrected them. He told them that he prayed at night and he slept. He married. He fasted and he broke his fast. He did not go to extremes with regards to this world and the needs of this world. But in general, he recommended that we be like strangers in this world. If we don't feel that sense of strangeness, then it means that our hearts are not healthy. If we find ourselves attached, addicted to the things of this world, then these are the signs of a diseased heart. And it will become evident in our priorities, in our conversations, when we gather and we speak, our attachments, our addictions will become clear. All we have to do is stop and think for a minute. What is the main topic of our conversations? Before we came here, this morning, yesterday, the day before, what were we talking about? Were well, we talking about things related to the world to come? About the law, his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Islam. Does this constitute the main topic of our conversations? Not that we never talk about anything else, but does it constitute the main topic? Do we relate things back to this topic? Or are we talking about other things? Cars, wives, husbands, children, homes, education. All of them with regards to how much we can make, how much will this job get us, how much will it cost to do this. Is this, is the material world, is that the main topic of our conversation? Then it means that we are not strangers in this world. We are attached, addicted to this world. The second sign that Ibn al-Qayyim identified, and this is among the signs, 
that one is upset with oneself when a sin is committed. One commits a sin. And we are all committing sins every day. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu bani Adam khutta. All of Adam's descendants constantly commit errors. So we will sin. No matter how righteous we try to be, we will commit sins. But the question is, when we commit the sin, how are we? What is the state of our hearts? Do we feel a sense of loss, of wrong? Are we upset with ourselves? Do we feel bad about it until we repent? Or when we commit the sin, it doesn't hurt us at all. The sin is, as some refer to it, like cutting a corpse. You take a knife and you wound a corpse. It doesn't feel pain. We're dead. We commit a sin and there is no pain. We don't feel any sense of pain. It's nothing. We might say it's not for a lot, but it's only a word that we said. If that is the way. If in fact when we commit sins, we feel pleasure. We feel tranquility, comfort in sin. And this is the sign that we're sick. Our hearts are diseased. These are the clear signs. Faith <coughs> is threatened. Righteous deeds are destroyed. The third of the signs is that one is more upset about missing the daily recitations of the Quran or dhikr that we should make in the morning or after our different prayers. We're more upset about missing it because of course as human beings do not as much as we want to try to set a program for ourselves and do it every day, things happen. We stay up later than usual or whatever, and we miss our daily recitation of Quran. Of course, this assumes that there is daily recitation of Quran. And for sure, our hearts cannot be healthy if we are not in touch with the Quran on a daily basis. Allah describes the Quran as being shifa'un lima fisuhi. It is a cure, a treatment for what is in the hearts. So if we're not availing ourselves of this cure, this treatment, then for sure we are sick. Our hearts are easy. And for those of us who have established that recitation, when we forget to do it, how do we feel? Do we feel upset? Or, no problem, I'll just do it tomorrow. If we don't feel upset, it means there's something wrong. It means that we're doing it as a ritual. Because daily recitation of the Quran, we can accept that this is what we should do. And set a program, but we're not really doing it from our hearts. We're just doing it because it's what we are supposed to do. Our parents told us to do it, or we are in the habit of doing it for one reason or another. Every reason except it being truly from our hearts. So when it's not truly from our hearts and we miss it, then we don't feel anything. 
The heart which is healthy, when it misses its daily recitation or remembrance of Allah, it feels more upset than if it lost wealth. Each and every one of us, we know how we feel when we lose wealth. When you lose your wallet, somebody broke into your car or into your house, something is stolen from you. How upset you get. How angry we are. Either with ourselves because we foolishly left the door of our car open or left the door of our house open or we did something, it's our fault. So we're upset with ourselves. How could you do that? It's so foolish. Do we feel that way when we miss our recitation of the Quran, when we miss making dhikr, remembrance of Allah? No. If we don't, and this is the sign of a diseased heart. And each one of these signs, as we look at it, we're identifying things which are necessary for us to purify our hearts. We're talking about the sign of the healthy heart, and in contrast, the sign of the diseased heart. This is also identifying for us what we need to do to develop the healthy heart. The fourth point is that we find greater pleasure in worshipping Allah than in eating and drinking. We just finished a meal. The meat tasted good, the rice was nice, the pizza, if we had pizza, was tasty. It was pleasurable. We got pleasure. Our salah. Do we get <coughs> similar pleasure from it or better or greater pleasure? We have to ask ourselves. Well, we know when the food is good, we want to eat more. But do we ever feel like we want to pray more? Or we know it's just four, so we just do the four. We try to do the minimum as opposed to trying to do the maximum as much as we can. Think about it. If food is more pleasurable to us than worship, then what is it saying about the state of our hearts? It's saying that the world, we're addicted to the world. The world has a greater place in our hearts than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, than the love of Allah, and the worship of Allah. Among the signs, of the healthy heart is that its main concern is in doing deeds purely for Allah's pleasure. What concerns the healthy heart is that what we do is truly for Allah's pleasure. In other words, it is concerned about riyah, doing deeds for the sake of others, for people, to be praised, to be admired, to be cheered, to be respected, doing deeds for the pleasure of others. And this is, of course, a great evil, an evil which destroys the value of our deeds. The Prophet ﷺ described it in a hadith found in Musnad Ahmed as being like the crawling of the ant. As the ant makes no sound, we can hardly perceive its crawling. Riyah comes upon us like it. Among the companions are those who described it like a black ant crawling on a black stone in the middle of a moonless night. Something which is upon us before we even know it. 
As a result, when the companions heard this from the Prophet they were worried. What to do? About Riyah, which we cannot see, which catches us without us really realizing it. And he advised us with a dua, which we need to learn to apply. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min an nushrika bika shay'an na'alam. Oh Allah, we seek refuge in you from giving partners to you knowingly. وَنَسْتَغْفِرُكَ لِمَا لَا نَعْلَمُ And we seek refuge in you from what we don't know. اللهم إني أو إنا نعوذ بك من أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلم ونستغفرك لما لا نعلم So we should have a concern. A concern that the righteous deeds that we are doing, that these are really for the sake of Allah and will be counted in our scale of good deeds and not be cancelled, negated, destroyed by Riyah. Among the signs is that when we stand to pray our oblig obligatory prayers and we make takbir, Allahu Akbar, our worries and concerns leave us. Our worries and our concerns go away. What most of us experience is that when we stand to make our prayers, we say Allah Akbar, it seems like all of the things that we weren't worrying about, weren't thinking about, come to us. This is the time when all of the worries and thoughts come to us. And we start thinking about things we hadn't been thinking about for days, weeks. They all seem to come at that time. We can hardly concentrate on the prayer. The prayer seems to be complete, finished. We can't even remember. Did we make a surah after Fatiha? We're not even certain about that. Did we make three rakah or was it four? We find ourselves constantly in that state. Now, to a certain degree, this is something unavoidable. This is something unavoidable. But where we find it to be the majority of the time, most of the time when we pray, our minds are filled with our worries. We have little or no concentration in our prayers. These are the signs of an unhealthy heart, a diseased heart. There's something wrong with our heart. And the seventh principle is that one who has a healthy heart is more stingy about wasting time than a greedy person is relative to his or her wealth. As the greedy person, that stingy person, doesn't like to see any of his wealth go away. When we get caught or we are invited to a fundraiser, like this evening, it's so hard to get anything out of our pockets. If it is to go down to the restaurant and to have a nice meal, you know, to buy some junk food. So many different ways that we waste our money. We look, just stop and look <coughs> over a week. How many ways that we have wasted our money in useless things which are of no benefit to us? But when 
we are called to give up some money for the sake of Allah. It becomes so difficult. We're very stingy with this money. Yes, Prophet Muhammad said that sadaqah does not decrease wealth. We heard him say it. Every time the fundraiser comes, the one who's raising the funds, he says the same thing. Charity does not decrease wealth. But in our minds, we are sure it does. If we give up some money, we're going to have less money. We don't have the money to, to play with, etc. So it's difficult. Though the Prophet told us that the only thing that will benefit us after we die, among the three things that will benefit us, is Charity, which is of continual benefit. People continue to benefit from it. And we're invited, we've given opportunities to do it. But, because of our stingy nature, we find it so difficult to come up with anything. So difficult. The healthy heart feels more greedy about time than our stingy hearts are about our monies. The stingy person is about his wealth. The healthy heart, when it comes to time, is very, very careful. <coughs> Whenever time is wasted, they feel the loss. Whenever they have engaged themselves in something which just killed time, they feel a genuine loss. As the Prophet had said, Ni'matani maghboonun fihima kathirun minat nas. There are two blessings about which most people are cheated. Satan deceives them and they are cheated. as wal faragh Good health and spare time. Good health and free time. The believer, when he has an opportunity to do a good deed, he doesn't delay it. She doesn't delay it for anything. As long as they're able to do it now, they do it. They are not fooled with the idea that we'll always have the ability, the strength, the health to do it. No, they do it now. What we find in the Muslim world today, so many of us, are in a position, for example, to make Hajj. But, we're not making any plans for Hajj. We're thinking, in the future, later on. In fact, our families will even tell us, don't go and make Hajj now, even if we decided to. You're too young. Because when you go and make Hajj, what does Hajj do? It's supposed to Clean your sins. Remove your sins. So, if you go and make Hajj now, you come back, what's going to happen? You're still young. Still many more sins to do. You missed out. So don't, don't make Hajj when you're young. You make Hajj when you're old. You can hardly do any more sins. You've run out of steam. Now is the time to go make Hajj. Go and you clean it all up. You come back like the day you were born. That's the process and the promise. It's a philosophy. Time. That we'll have the health and the strength to do it. Of course, this assumes that a person who has lived a sinful life, deliberately committing sins with the idea down the line, 
And this sounds like who? The brothers of Yusuf, isn't it? When they said, we'll throw him in the, the well, and then we'll go ask forgiveness. <laughs> this is the plan, right? This kind of mentality, of course. The act of seeking forgiveness is of no benefit. That person who has lived that sinful life is reached old age, she has reached old age, and they now go off to make Hajj. Do you think they can make a Hajj in which, as Allah said, لا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. No evil speech, corrupt speech, corrupt action, argumentation, conflict in Hajj. I mean, you're shocked. Some of you who are planning to go on Hajj, you'll be shocked. You'll be making tawaf, or you'll be going to stone the Jamarat in different places. And you'll see old people there kicking and punching and pushing and saying, Grandfather, grandmother, this is Hajj. You know, be gentle. You wonder how, how? Why? Because. They are not making the Hajj which the Prophet ﷺ showed us, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed. Going through the ritual. And this is why people wonder, the Saudi authorities, they really haven't organized things too well. Every year so many people die on Hajj. But why? Because they're waiting until the end of their lives, deliberately. They're old, can hardly walk. Some of them, they're going up the stairs to get into the plane, they fall and die. The plane arrives, they're walking down the stairs, they trip and they fall and they die. <laughs> Try to get on the bus, they fall over and they die. People dying all the way along the match. And of course, the idea of dying in Mecca is a wonderful thing, but <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. But you don't plan it this way. You know? This is how people are thinking. So we don't complete the Hajj. We don't do the Hajj as it should be done. The Jamarat becomes a trial. Serious. Every year, people die at the Jamarat. Part of it is, yes, people are, you know, their whole attitude towards it is incorrect. But also, it's part of it is just that people are just too old. Infirm. Their health isn't there. They delay the Hajj. They could have made it at the time when their health was there, they could have gone through and done a complete hatch properly, but they delayed it. This is deception. They have been deluded. Shaitan has fooled them. They have lost it. Batch. And spare time. People could refer to it as what? Time to kill. Got some time to kill? Time to blow, to waste, have some fun. Time when Islam is put at the side, then you go and do something. Free time. Allah tells us, If you find spare time, free time, you're finished. What you had to do, what, what Allah has prescribed for you. Found some. Establish another form of worship. When Allah told us, in the salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mati lillahi rabbil alameen, indeed, my prayers, sacrifices, living and dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. This is telling us that there is no time that we should not be worshipping Allah. Whatever we're doing, we should transform it. Even if it is something which is not normally associated with worship, we transform it into worship by fulfilling the principles which Islam has defined for all of our acts. We do it seeking the pleasure of Allah. Do it with the remembrance of Allah. Do it according to the way of Rasulullah. So we try to make everything that we do in our lives ways and means of worship. So we have then no spare time. 
There's no time that we can afford to be lost, gone, wasted, killed. That we will look back and regret. None of us has done so many good deeds that we can say, okay, come on. I got enough to get me into paradise. I can now have some fun. No. It's not to say that Muslims don't have fun cannot have fun, etc. But it is fun according to what is acceptable to the religion. We don't live outside the boundaries of the religion. Allah has defined for us the boundaries of right and wrong. And we live within them. So, faith and righteous deeds which is the foundation of everything in Islam is in fact a matter of the heart. It becomes real and benefits us when our hearts are he healthy. As Allah said, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ except for the one who comes to Allah with a healthy heart. And what is related to this, faith and righteous deeds, being a matter of the heart, is that the greatest of our worries, the most difficult of our circumstances, are resolved by the healthy heart. If our heart is healthy, then we don't suffer from the stress, the disorientation, the uh, anger, outbursts, all of the various psychological and physiological <coughs> problems that people face today. One with the healthy heart is free of them. As the Prophet ﷺ said, one who makes this world his or her goal. The dunya. One who makes this world his or her goal. Then Allah will cause their affairs to be scattered all of the matters of their lives, instead of being in place, systematic, that you can deal with them one after the other, they're scattered. Things are here, there, everywhere. You reach for this one, another problem comes. You solve this and another problem comes. You're just in a state of constant worry, you know, confusion, problems. Life is just a burden. The one who makes this world his goal. And in spite of all of that, he will only receive, will only be able to attain from this world, the material things that he will be able to, be, to gain, will only be what Allah has already written for him or her. We will not get any more than what God has destined for us. No matter how hard we try, we will not get any more. We will only get what Allah has destined. But if the individual makes the akhirah, the world to come, is our goal, then Allah will give them a richness of heart. They will feel a sense of richness in their heart. Though they may not have the material around them, but they will have a rich heart. As the Prophet had said, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى مِنْ كَثْرَةُ الْعَرَبِ That richness is not from having many possessions. لَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى النَّفْسِ The true richness is richness of the soul. That richness of the soul only comes 
from true faith, righteous deeds, based in a healthy heart. A person with that healthy heart will achieve tranquility of the heart, a heart at rest, at peace with God. Desire to meet Allah. And Allah loving to meet that heart. So the one who makes the Akhirah, the life to come, his goal or her goal, Allah gives them that richness of heart. And He pulls all their affairs together for them. Everything will fall into place. They can be dealt with without the stress faced by those who have made this world their goal. And the world will come to them on its knees, crawling to them, offering itself, begging them to take on it. And it is up to them to take what they wish. So my brothers and sisters, let us reflect on this matter of the heart. The heart being the most important organ of our bodies, where our faith resides, from which righteous deeds spring forth. Let us take care of our hearts. Let us reflect on the state of our hearts. Because if we don't reflect on it, if we don't reflect on them, then we will carry on in this world with hearts which are corrupted, hearts which are not guided by the light of Islam, hearts dead, hardened by our continual rituals without the spirit. Islam behind it. This is a challenge to each and every one of us. Islam cannot be inherited. Islam is a choice. A choice which each and every one of us has to make. And when we choose it, we have to choose it for the right and then we have to work on ourselves on all levels so that we become worthy of the light of Islam and we become representatives of Islam. Islam becomes manifest in our actions, in our deeds, as it did with the early generations that conveyed Islam from Arabia to the rest of the world. This is the only way forward for us. It is the source of guidance which will give us the necessary patience to do what we have to do, to build what we are obliged to build to convey the messages that are an obligation on us to convey. Without it, we will not have the patience to do the job that is required of us by Islam. And we will impatiently do the wrong things. Our priorities will be distorted. We will not focus on the most important issues that we should be dealing with in our lives. Instead, we'll be caught up in issues which are beyond our control, things that we cannot change. We will be worked up about. Our energy will be focused in things we cannot change. And the things that we could change, which are within our grasp, we will ignore them.
our priorities upside down. This is the consequence of hearts which are not clean, not pure, not healthy, not able to receive the light of Islam, to accept the faith of Islam, and to do the righteous deeds which grow from that faith. I ask Allah to purify our intentions tonight. To make this humble gathering a point of a new beginning from which we can turn our lives around. I ask Allah to give us the courage to tackle our own weaknesses, to purify our hearts, to learn the religion of Islam and to live it. These are the few thoughts that I wanted to share with you this evening. Uh, as is customary, if you have any questions that you'd like to raise, uh, feel free to do so. Of course, questions regarding the topic of the presentation are most welcome. If we run out of those, then one's off the topic. <coughs> <clears throat> you may raise your hand if you have any questions. Sheikh, uh, I remember the last lecture. Uh, the, the world we are living right now has so much confusion. And unfortunately, confusion is coming from the so-called zone. Okay. Very hard to get ourselves on the straight path. And because every day, it's more and more confusion is coming. And they use Quran and Hadith. So what should like, we should do in, in this situation? Um, in current situation, we are suffering on the the worldly level, political level, uh, spiritual level. So how we can put our heart on the straight path? Well, we must first understand the faith and practice of Islam. If we have not understood what is the correct faith, what is the correct practice of Islam, then there will always remain confusion in the world, Muslim world, among Muslims, in, within families, outside of families, in communities, outside of communities. This will remain. Knowledge is the cure for the disease of ignorance. Ignorance promotes disunity. Knowledge is the foundation of Muhammad that made it obligatory on each and every one of us. We need to gain the correct knowledge of Islam. That's why we spoke initially about the correct faith. Knowing what Islam really is. And then applying it. Applying it according to the Quran and the Sunnah as it was conveyed to us authentically, and in accordance with the understanding of the first generations. Because following the Quran and Sunnah, we all agree upon, we all agree is a requirement. However, according to whose interpretation? This is where we find an element of confusion. We have different interpretations. Well, to some degree, there will always be differences. But if we agree that the understanding of the first generation is to be given priority over later understandings, 
then we have a foundation, a strong foundation from which to unify our ranks, from which to work uh, together to fulfill the obligations of Islam. If we accept that principle, if we don't, and it becomes a question of your interpretation, mine, his, hers, etc., then of course we cannot come together. We'll continue to be divided. And we'll only increase our division with every generation. So knowledge is the foundation. It's the starting point. Many of us who have come to this country, for example, from different parts of the Muslim world, where we have found ourselves uh, in our ignorance of Islam, challenged by the society around us. Many of us have come and learned about Islam as we never understood before. Back home in our countries, we just lived lives. Muslims, everybody did this thing and we, we believed it was Islam. Later on we came to find that much of it was culture. But there really wasn't Islam at all. It was just cultural practices. Cultural and customary beliefs and practices. So, this situation here, in spite of certain evils that exist with it, has become a means of enlightenment to many Muslims. We need to further that enlightenment, increase our knowledge of Islam, take that knowledge back to our homelands, and try to help fuel that awakening which is now taking place throughout the Muslim world where we fuel it with the correct fuel, with the correct understanding. The understanding which is based on the understanding of that early generation. Free from the extremes, the misunderstandings, the impatience that exists around us in some parts of the Muslim world today, which has created many problems for Muslims all over, 